What's going on everyone? Seth Miranda. This is Adorama Rewind and uh, I'm coming to you from the Netherlands. I'm here in Amsterdam for IBC 2019. Lots of amazing announcements, lots of really cool things happening on the show floor and you can check out our daily coverage right here on this channel. Uh, but in between that I had to rewind and I know what you're thinking, why aren't you outside showing us all the bicycles and the canals and the beautiful Amsterdam that's going on out there? Well, it's nighttime, it's windy and I gotta fit this in sometime between uh, covering that trade show. So I threw up two NAND lights, got my Nikon going and we're just gonna go for it. Uh, first up is travel bloggers arrested in Iran for flying drone without permit. Yeah, so this couple right here actually quit their jobs, Mark Firkin and Jolie King. They quit their jobs in 2017 and uh, were traveling around the world. And what happened was a uh, drone was flown by them and they were arrested by officials in Iran. So the family was like, where are they? They went missing around June, and two months later, a news source over there uh, reported that they were in Evan Jail, which is notorious for being a very tough prison. Uh, and the Australian government is trying to talk to the Iranian government and trying to get them freed, but they're looking like it's, it's pretty grim and they might not ever get released. So uh, that's pretty crazy. I hope we can stay up on this story and get a good conclusion to it. Um, let's take a look at phase one XT is a tiny medium format field camera for $57,000. This is a pretty incredible piece of machinery here. So we're looking at a medium format system right here. This image on the back is by uh, Ruben Wu and I'll show you some of those images in a second. But what we're looking at here is a medium format setup that also uses rodent stock lenses that have shift control. So it's 150 megapixel uh, IQ4 that is within the IQ uh, system obviously and it's super super compact I mean really really tiny for what it is and it is available with any of these lenses from rodent stock that have 24 millimeters of shift on the X and Y axis so you can actually have perspective control and it's supposed to have minimal buttons minimal controls on the outside so that it's really intuitive and you're le worrying less about the actual settings and able to shoot more genuine and organically is what they're saying. Uh, this is supposed to be like a really small setup and make it very user friendly. Uh, I'm just gonna show you this really quick. This is Ruben Wu. Uh, watch the video on this page, it's from phase one. And these are the images he's doing using a drone with long shutter drag to create these effects. Uh, it's pretty precise, really, really beautiful stuff. And the quality behind phase one is in remarkable. Uh, what's really cool is phase one is also the company that brought you Capture One. So they're constantly bringing this like level of quality standard and you're seeing more and more people use Capture One over Lightroom, especially for tethering. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, Daniel, Vanessa Joy, we're all on Capture One and it's um, from the same company that's been making these next level cameras really, okay? Uh, so let's start going into some tiny bit of depressing news. Uh, Robert Frank passed away, yep. Uh, documented photographer died at 94. So he's famous for this book, The Americans, which was a, uh, it was a group of images that he shot during a tour of America in the 50s. Uh, it was 27,000 images that he then edited down to about 83 images and made a book of it in an iconic series. And what was so great about him was he was an immigrant he was from Zurich, and when he got here, he started being uh, his professional photography career, sh shot fashion for Harper's Bazaar, things like that. And he uh, got a grant or something like that to go and travel the country. And what he did was he traveled 10,000 miles and just shot in cities where the people were, in his opinion. And what he shot was the diversity in America and these odd moments that he claims you can't describe. So instead of being a documentary photographer that was referential, he documented these things that you couldn't probably put your finger on, but gave you a really deep sense of the social structure and just the community and things that were happening uh, on a social level, like with people in that time period in this country. I mean, a lot of images with juke uh, boxes in them and um, different uh, people from different ethnicities and things like that. Uh, it's a really, really pinnacle piece of work. I have a copy, but I was gonna show it to you, but then I realized I was gonna be on the road and I didn't bring it. Uh, I, I love this book. I, I saw, I was fortunate enough to see some of his work at the Met and uh, it's really a great body to uh, study from and if you're a younger photographer out there and you don't know about this or haven't gone to any like photography schooling or anything like that, do yourself a favor, just jump and get this book. It's not that expensive and it's pretty uh, important in the history of photography itself. Uh, on top of Robert Frank passing, 
uh, Vancouver lost renowned photographer Fred Herzog. So Herzog is a great uh, street photographer from the 50s and 60s, and he shot the people, and they're claiming that he has the most intimate look at Vancouver itself, which I pretty much believe uh, he, just, he passed away. I couldn't mention Robert Frank without mass mentioning him. We just lost Peter Lindbergh uh, last week, and it just seems like it keeps going. And to cap out the obituary section here, um, Charlie Cole, photojournalist behind the iconic Tank Man during the Tiananmen Square uh, issue, um, protest, I should say, uh, passed away as well. And just so you know, Char um, uh, Charlie Cole also went on record by saying he felt bad that his images overshadowed the events that actually happened. It was very complex what was going on at that moment. And this is an image that lasted well beyond uh, a lot of things that might have been documented in there. So uh, during that uh, protest. So check uh, out the images from that. I'm going to put all the, as many links as I can down below so you guys have some referential points. Um, and I'm going to, I know that was a down point, but I think it was very important for us to know these uh, iconic people that we're losing from these eras that built the pathway that we got to where we are now. So um, hold tight. In the end, I'm going to throw the question of the week, and I think it's going to be uh, right there with what's going on right now. Uh, also, let's talk about some gear news because there's really cool stuff coming out, especially with IBC upon us, but this one's really fun. This is Polaroid uh, uh, Originals created this thing, which is basically a film recorder. You can make actual one-step Polaroid prints from your phone using the Polaroid Originals app. It's about 130 bucks for this uh, gizmo. It's nothing new, right? Like we've seen stuff like this before. Uh, the Polaroid Daylight 35, 35 Plus, the 8x10, uh, Vivitar made machine, and these were all making prints from slides. And there were even some stuff that lets you do this from a phone. Fuji Instax makes their version, which is more of a, it connects via Wi-Fi and can print from your phone to an analog real piece of film. And that's awesome. And, and just making things tangible is great. I think if uh, I had kids or something like that, I would totally be like, hey, this is what prints are. Look how fun they are, you know, things like that. Uh, check it out. I'm sure the cost is in the long run with the film, but sometimes it's just better to have that photo stick on your wall or right on the fridge and it's always in your life rather than in your phone until you get to it. And a lot of people don't get that sometimes. So. Uh, Think a little bit more about printing some of your photos. Just, just think about that and may bring them into the world for real. Uh, let's talk about Sigma for a second. They are giving up on the Pentax K mount. Yeah, so Pentax says we're done making lenses for the Pentax K mount. Basically, what's happening here is Pentax is making, um, is not the Pentax lenses that Sigma makes aren't selling that well. So they're going like, look, we have our own mount, the L mount, the EF mount, the F mount, the Z mount, the R mount, the E mount, I mean, the elemental P mount. They have eight zillion mounts to worry about now, uh, and they have to let go of some things and focus resources elsewhere, and they decided once and for all they're not going to support the, uh, the uh, Pentax K mount any longer. So if you are a Pentax user, and I know we have a huge fan base uh, that watch this show of uh uh, Pentax users because you all got very boisterous when I asked you who out there is using Pentax months ago on an episode uh, So you're gonna lose a lens manufacturer and that being said that doesn't mean that there aren't other lenses that are out there available for the came out and it doesn't mean that the Sigma lenses just poof and vanish the ones they've already made are out there in the world so you can seek them secondhand or old stock or whatever uh, this one is a little tricky. So a photographer is accusing a digital artist of theft. So you can see here, this is what this guy shoots. Uh, what's his name? It's Jason Weingart shoots what he calls extreme uh, weather. And you can see right here that that's the piece of his image. And the digital artist Brent Shavnor is, shows a lot of work. He doesn't try to say that he shot these images. He does say that he's manipulating images and making composites and making digital artwork. And he does flip them and make them backwards and upside down to kind of change the intent of the image. So what happened was is the photographer Weingart said, hey man, I just found a bunch of my images in your images and what the hell. And uh, the Brent is basically saying, hey, I bought these off of Shutterstock and other um, uh, stock image sites, so the licensing is fair to use. Uh, now the photographer said, oh really? And went through all of the libraries because he knows he didn't upload his images to those stock libraries and says he didn't find them, so he thinks he's lying. Then this digital artist uh, replied back going, Oh, my mistake. That was actually from an old set of images that I did from a different library I used to work with. And he's like, no, I don't buy any of this. And they've been going back and forth on social media and he finally slapped uh, 
the photographer finally slapped the digital artist with an invoice of just under $10,000 for the usage of his images and saying that he hasn't had any reply. I think it is officially going to the lawyers and we'll see what happens with that. Let me know what you think about that down in the comments. Um, is, is not using the whole image still too far? Like if we just use pieces of it to create a new piece, uh, is it is it okay? And I know that most photographers will jump and say, no, it's not okay. Uh, it depends on how much of it. Is it using the original intent of the image? Where did they find it? All sorts of things are at play here, but I can understand why that photographer would be upset for sure. Uh, another new release, Fuji just dropped the XA7 24.2 APS-C camera. Of course it's APS-C, it's Fuji and with the X mount. So it does have 4K video, it does have eight frames per second. They're saying it has improved autofocus and better in low light and this articulating screen, which is great for vloggers. It's pretty much an entry level camera with a lot of fun colors and we're looking at about $700. Uh, for a price point on that. So another one for Fuji out there. And let's start talking about some iPhones because we know that the 11 Pro just got announced. And let's talk about that because there's a lot of stuff packed in there on a photography standpoint. Apple unveils the 11 Pro with triple lenses and cameras and deep fusion. So what does this mean? So basically it has three cameras built into it. An ultra wide 13 millimeter F2.4, a wide 26 millimeter F1.8, a telephoto 52 millimeter F2.8, 2.0 on those tiny phone sensors and they're also saying that it does this thing called deep fusion so what's actually happening well what's going on is that when you take a photo with this uh, phone it actually takes a multiple of images it takes about nine images in total so it's going to take a short exposure a long exposure some other secondary images and what it's going to do is combine them you got to think of it kind of like an hdr system where it's going to take well the shadows here have the lowest amount of noise and the highlights here are the least blown and this has more sh uh, sharp detail to it and it keeps on putting those pieces together. And I guess you would call it like somewhat of a composite, kind of like HDR, but not really. It's doing the best it can to give you a maximum dynamic range of what a natural scene would look like or just an optimized version image of what you took a photo of. You can see here that in night mode, it just amplifies that light right there. So if you are shooting at night, um, it can still get you an image. Uh, I don't know, is this important to you? Are you someone that cares about your phone? Um, I'm curious about that. Uh, I think it's great to have any tool you can have on you. Like you're always gonna have your phone on you these days anyway. So I guess it's kind of great to have the most amount of ability with the camera that's in that phone. Uh, the fact that they call it like professional quality, professionalist, I don't, I don't know about that. We've seen movies on Netflix uh, like Tangerine being shot with all iPhones, but that's like a, a one-off case. Like there's reasons other equipment exists. So to call it like professional quality is a little bit of a stretch for me, uh, but it is cool to give us more flexibility and versatility and just plain out ability with the phones we already carry. Uh, so that is pretty interesting. And it's just kind of cool to see how far technology can go. Uh, good news for your pocket wizard owners like this guy right here and Daniel Norton out there. Uh, the e-release has just been announced and it is really just a firmware update that costs about 10 bucks. And what they're saying is that it will give you better reliability. You will get more zones, a longer range, up to miles, they're saying. So the enhanced reliability is cool because it's gonna give you uh, connectivity and surefire of your strobes or camera, depending on what system you're using the pocket wizard for. Uh, in high noise environments, meaning if there's a lot of, if you're in a city and there's tons of wavelengths flying around, uh, the Paco Wizard already does use uh, frequencies and wavelengths and things like that that are not typical to this level of uh, airspace. They usually use ones that are in uh, planes up, up high miles above the earth so that they're uninterrupted down here. This is giving you longer range miles distance. So you could actually set something up and go climb a mountain if you watch their uh, promo material. Check out the link below. And for you Canon users, just in case you wanted to know when you're gonna get your flagship mirrorless, they're saying 2021. Yeah, the R series has had a little bit of a rough start for sure. Uh, it's had mixed reception and the R series being one card slot and having some 
handicaps on a few things they have in there, like the crop 4K and stuff like that. Uh, people are claiming that it's not a pro mirrorless. And to be honest with you, there aren't many pro mirrorless cameras out there. But we were thinking that we would see in 2020 a flagship mirrorless, but it looks like the flagship will be more towards 2021 when it comes to Canon itself. Um, they are still teasing that they're going to drop a 1DX Mark III. Uh, and of course, Nikon just announced their D6, which is going to be optical, but they also haven't mentioned anything else about their mirrorless. So there's a lot of things that are still coming, and I guess we just have to wonder how long will it take to get here from certain brands and manufacturers. Uh, the A9 from Sony seems to be like the top performing mirrorless out there and we are assuming that there's an A9 II coming so uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Canon when they have their flagship being announced two years from now or maybe a full year from now in, in theory um, and will it compete with what's already out there at that time if, Sony, if Nikon drops something major and Sony has an update to the A9. Stuff to think about kids but speaking of Sony... The FX9 has been announced. Uh, we have a video right here where we show hands-on uh, going through the features of it. Well, not so much hands-on, but there is footage from it. Uh, it is a 6K sensor. We're talking about a lot of dynamic range. Dual base ISO 800 and ISO 4000. Cinematic color space with F Cinetone and an electronic variable ND built into it. Uh, it's a pretty interesting camera. What they basically did was take the Sony Venice and they shrunk it down. They made it a small Venice. Uh, it's pretty, uh, well, they also mixed in some of the FS series with it as well. So it's, and they claim that they mixed in a little bit of the Alpha series into it. So I think what they did was they go, we've been doing a lot of cool things, with a lot of different lines. How can we put it together with the most optimal of all of them and put it out there? And that's what I think the FX9 is. They're saying they've heard a lot of what people are saying. Uh, there's definitely some physical controls out there that are outside, out of the menus and now physically on the camera for uh, easier use. Well, it's pretty cool, right? So uh, if you're interested in Sony Cinema, I recommend checking out that piece of gear. So let's talk about some lenses. Um, Rokinon has a line called Zine, and Zine just released a line called Zine CF. So Zine CF is a cinema lens line, but what's really cool about it is it's way smaller than the, their traditional cinema line, and it has this right here. If you see this greenish tint, that is actually uh, glow-in-the-dark writing so you can actually see your t-stops and markings and all that stuff um in the dark while you're working which is pretty cool honestly uh it comes in various sizes of course 24 millimeter 50 millimeter 85 comes in canon ef sony e and pl mounts and they're pretty affordable i think like the top end price on this line is 2500 dollars, and for a cinema lens that's super super affordable so if you're and it's also really good for mirrorless systems the littler cameras we're talking better balance because it's not so front heavy uh, not a lot of stress on a lens mount that really wasn't meant to take hardcore big giant cinema lenses um if you, and of course you'd rail it up and cage it and all sorts of stuff but in case you aren't uh it's always good to have a smaller compact lens on a smaller body just, just it's always just better uh okay let's talk about black magic they just put out something that's pretty interesting and very relevant to today it is the atm mini 2019 so this guy right here notice how it's got white and red buttons yeah, very youtube -y, right? What this basically does is allow for HDMI inputs and two stereo audio inputs, and it'll actually put it back out as a 1080p webcam symbol, signal via USB. Sorry, it is late here. I'm like slipping on my words. It's gonna take all these HDMI inputs from like various cameras, maybe computers if you're running feeds like Twitch, or maybe if you're doing stuff like me and Daniel do, or do demos and shoot, and you can see our tether live. It takes all that information, puts it through this box, and puts it out as a webcam signal so you can use it with like Streamlabs, OBS, and just get it right out there to YouTube, Twitch, um, Facebook, even Skype. So that's pretty amazing and it's pretty affordable. I think it's like right under $300, which is pretty great. Switch your system for you to handle while you're live. And I did try it out at IBC. It is super, super easy, very intuitive. And it's definitely a gateway to someone who's not sure how to really do production on their own and want a higher level of it for their content. Well, this definitely gets you used to the, the mentality it takes to do live switching, which is great. So let's talk about Let's See. Uh, we saw this at IBC. You can check out the recap of day one to see how cool these are. The Rugged SSD and the Rugged Boss SSD. Let's take a look at these really quick. Uh, so this is an SSD drive, fits in the palm of your hand, two terabytes, can take two tons 
crush proof and IP67 meaning go down underwater at least a meter for up to 30 minutes no problem its speed of 950 megabytes up to 2 terabytes of storage Thunderbolt 3 USB 3.0 USB-C and of course the 3 meter drop resistance if it can handle 2 tons of crush resistance also comes in a black pro version which is 2800 megabyte speed uh, read and we're talking about Thunderbolt 3 as well um, what's really cool about these is that it gives you peace of mind they're small drives that can take a ton of excuse you don't have to like baby them you don't have to worry about them and you have two terabytes up to two terabytes of space extra in your bag in your pocket hand off to somebody just know it's there super super um it's a super peace of mind like i i keep uh rugged drives on me all the time uh this i'm definitely picking up uh and then they also came out with something that's super cool which is the rugged SSD boss. Let's take a look at this thing really quick. So first of all, this is a screen on top of it. This is an SD card slot, a USB-C port, a USB-A port, and then this is a connector that goes all around and boom, you have the option of having Lightning or USB-C for Android. So you have Lightning for iOS, I, um, iOS devices, and you can handle um, your Android device as well just by changing the cable that comes with it. What's cool about this? Few things. One, it has that SD card slot that you can take your, uh, out of your device, your camera, whatever, unload all that footage into this hard drive, which is awesome because it has a screen on it that'll actually tell you how long it's taking, how much of the drive has space on it, and you can double check it by opening up the LaCie app on your phone and seeing what is actually happening in the drive, what's on there, checking the footage, checking the images, sending them out, or taking stuff from your phone and putting it onto this uh, device, which is great. Also, it's self-powered with built-in lithium-ion rechargeable battery which is great because it can actually output uh, power as well. So if I plug my phone into this in the field, it'll actually charge my phone. Kind of crazy, right? Now also you can plug it into the wall if you have an outlet near you and you can just run it as a hub and just power things out of the USB ports and uh, you know other devices from the Lightning or USB-C cable. Really, really cool. So we've seen this before. We've seen uh, devices that are claiming you don't need a laptop to use them uh, to clear up your memory. Well, here's the one from LaCie, a very trusted brand, and uh, it's rugged. I mean, they're saying it's drop-proof, splash-proof. Um, I'm sure it's not like dunkable but you know you get up to a terabyte of space at 430 megabytes per second super fast and that's pretty awesome uh and to wrap up the news i'm gonna go and tell you that sony will be at photo plus 2019 yep so this was something that was going around people heard that uh there was a floor plan leak or something like that and they didn't see any sony booth and sony is one of the top three contributors to buying floor space at photo plus and they were like whoa photo plus might go under because of this not the case. Uh, they're claiming that it was an oversight, that it was a delay in finalizing or whatever, or I don't know. But I can tell you that uh, Sony will be there uh, according to newest reports, which is great because I love trade shows. Um, I know people think that they're dying or whatever, and there are definitely trade shows scaling back. But it's pretty awesome to go to a trade show and just see who's out there, see who's shooting, see how other people uh, gear up, what their kits are, what... Uh, gear is out there get it in your hands not just read a bunch of spec sheets or watch some guy on youtube spit a bunch of specs at you and tell you what's good based on numbers because there's plenty of cameras out there that on spec sheets don't look that great but are absolutely amazing and other gear as well so it's pretty cool to just go to a trade show get out of your own head and into a communal space so i urge you go hit up a trade show. And having said that, I will be at Photo Plus shooting live at the Westcott booth and maybe somewhere else. I haven't finalized that, but I also will be at Imaging USA in Nashville in January. I have a photo walk and a platform stage class. You must sign up for it. So check that out if you're going to Imaging USA in 2020 in January. And I will be at WPPI in February teaching a couple classes there as well. So if you want to come to any of my workshops, go to those websites and sign up for my workshops. All right, I'm gonna keep it there and I gotta hurry up and put this together for you guys and get it up. So, question of the week. With the passing of Robert Frank and um, others, I just wanted, to, and Peter Lindbergh and some other iconic photographers, I wanna ask you, who do you think is happening right now that's doing things that will be iconic for generations to come. We had this era, we had these guys, they had their time, their work is still legacy. 
what is going on right now that you would put down in the comments and tell people you need to pay attention to this because it's going to have longevity to it. Let me know down in the comments. Of course, share this video around, hit subscribe. We are almost at a million subscribers and you are one in a million if you are one of our subscribers. So thank you very much. Uh, we can't do this without you. Hit the bell so you don't miss any videos. We're gonna have more recaps from IBC. So come back and check out that. We're getting them up as soon as we can as we're at the trade show floor. Um, and you know, just be good to each other. Write a comment and respond to each other in the comments. You don't just gotta talk to me, talk to each other. It's a community. All right guys, it's gonna do it for me. Thanks so much. Peace.